Jamie Lee Curtis shot to stardom after her film debut as Laurie Strode in John Carpenter's Halloween, and quickly followed this up by appearing in a plethora of early 80s horror films where she was appropriately dubbed the Scream Queen. However, her character went AWOL from the Halloween franchise after its first sequel in 1981, and wouldn't appear again until she made her triumphant return in 1998's H2O. And while Laurie's absence was subject to multiple timeline explanations, there was almost a version of Halloween 4, which would have seen her return to the series a lot sooner. What is up Scream Team, Zach Cherry here, and if you're as obsessed with horror movies as I am, you might want to hit that subscribe button and turn on those bell notifications, setting them to all. That way, you can stay up to date with all my latest content. In this video, we're diving into another unmade sequel of the Halloween franchise, where this script, again like the previous one, would have been an alternate Halloween 4. Just as a reference, all of the information in this video has been sourced from the book Taking Shape 2, which is a very in-depth look into the pre-production of each Halloween installment, including many of its rejected sequel scripts. Highly recommend picking yourself up a copy. So just for shits and gigs, toss this video a thumbs up and maybe in the comment section down below to let me know what you think about the original idea for the return of Laurie Strode. Let's get into it. So just to understand where the filmmakers were at before this script landed in their laps, we're gonna go over an abridged recap of the tumultuous battle for the Halloween franchise's production rights. In my last video, I detailed the John Carpenter produced Dennis Etchison written script that was set to be directed by Joe Dante. This idea was ultimately scrapped by both Erwin Yablons and Mustafa Akkad for being too supernatural as they wanted something more similar to the first two movies. Feeling creatively stifled by their partners and not wanting to make the same story over and over again, both John Carpenter and Deborah Hill put their stakes in the franchise up for sale, which were then immediately purchased by Akkad. With just the two rights holders remaining, Yablons would eventually grow weary of making more Halloween films himself, but rather than this being due to creative differences, it was instead caused from the stress brought upon by the cutthroat nature of the business. He retired from Hollywood for good and sold his remaining shares to Akkad, thus making The Godfather of the Halloween franchise, its sole rights holder. Does that all make sense? Perfect, now you're up to speed. Since Universal had opted out of the franchise after the commercial failure of Season of the Witch, this had become the first time since the original that a Halloween film had no major studio backing, meaning that Akkad would be financing the film entirely through himself. To cut down on costs, he launched an open call for screenwriters everywhere, Writers Guild or not, to pitch their own take on Halloween 4, under the one condition that Michael be a true flesh and blood killer. Out of hundreds of submitted screenplays, with only a handful of them being purchased, the one that had stood out to Akkad the most was composed by the writing duo of Daniel Kenny and Mark Allen Medina. True to the call, neither of them were certified Writers Guild members. In fact, Medina had been the lead singer of an 80s new wave rock band and had collaborated with Kenny, who was a friend of his bassist, that had heard about the open call through the grapevine. Although they each had somewhat of a small background in film, it was their appreciation for the music scene that brought them together, infusing much of this influence into their script, which they dubbed as the Halloween sequel for the MTV generation. In contrast to the Etchison script, where the story was filled to the brim with practically every living character from the first two movies, except for Laurie and Loomis, this script instead would only feature those two characters coming back, with the obvious inclusion of Michael Myers as well. Like with the eventual Halloween 4, this story would also take place in 1988, 10 years after the events of the first two movies, and with Laurie back at the helm, you might even say this was her H1O. H10? Similar to H2O, but unlike every other script that had been submitted for Halloween 4, this story takes its characters out of Haddonfield and transplants them in a brand new location. But where H2O had Lori living in hiding in a rural area in Northern California, this return instead sees her out in the forefront of Chicago's booming fashion and music industry. It's within this urban sprawl where she lives a lavish, high-powered lifestyle as an 80s modern businesswoman, working as the editor for a high-end magazine and driving a flashy BMW to and from her fancy upscale house located in the suburbs. Lori is shown to be living a very happy and successful life. She's married to a surgeon named Terrence Jameson, whose name she's also taken, now making her Lori Jameson, and together they have a six-year-old daughter named Stephanie. Also staying with them in their home is Terrence's teenage sister, Heather, who is currently in from California, visiting the family for a few weeks. Now, even though on the surface, a lot of this does feel similar to H2O, there is one major difference with Lori's character. 
she has absolutely zero memory of Michael Myers or the events that befell her on Halloween night of 1978. This largely explains why she's got her life so well together, which is of course a far cry from where we pick up with her and either of her later anniversary films. However, beneath this facade, Lori is plagued by nightmares and panic attacks, all of which are a result of her subconscious repressive state. One nightmare in particular even depicts her on a photo shoot for work where she's surrounded by hundreds of mannequins, which does feel very emblematic of the shape, although it should be noted that this script instead refers to him as the silhouette. Lori is revealed to be going to therapy to help her understand these nightmares, and of course, in true Halloween plot twist fashion, it's revealed that her psychiatrist is none other than Dr. Sam Loomis. But despite the fact that Lori's memory loss has also caused her to forget who Dr. Loomis is, his intentions in helping her are shown to be altruistic, as he genuinely has become somewhat of a paternal guardian to her, which probably would have made this one of his least maniacal outings. As for how Loomis survived the explosion at the hospital, that also links us to Michael's resurrection, as it were, since the story opens with a flashback to the finale of Halloween 2. In it, we witness both Loomis and Michael being rescued from the fire. Loomis's burns are severe, but said to be non-life threatening, while Michael's chances of survival are stated by the on-scene EMS to be very slim. In an attempt to save his life, both he and Loomis are airlifted out on separate helicopters where they're flown to an emergency burn center in nearby Chicago. However, medics fail to notice the worn out safety cable on Michael's stretcher, which snaps in half en route to the clinic while over top Lake Michigan. This sends Michael plunging into the waters below, where his body is never recovered and it's eventually believed by authorities that he drowned. Michael's eventual reappearance in the script, 10 years later, has him literally just showing up in town. There's no supernatural caveats to speak of, he hasn't been laying in a coma somewhere, he just decides that now is the time to come back into Lori's life. In that regard, this becomes another parallel to H2O, as it was in that timeline where we find out that his body just disappeared in the fire, whereas in the Thorn trilogy and the current David Gordon Green timeline, he was just reinstitutionalized. So it's anyone's guess where he's been that whole time. If you want to extrapolate some sort of working theory, we did find out in Halloween Resurrection that he was living underneath his childhood home for 20 years, so perhaps in this universe he was doing the same thing for the last 10 years. Otherwise, there's really no special reason or occasion as to why he's chosen to resurface, especially since Lori hasn't exactly been keeping a low profile over the years. But Michael does like his anniversary, so that's as good a reason as any, I suppose. After the initial flashback and supposed drowning of Michael, we we immediately follow Lori over the course of the next year or so, where we're shown the passing of time through a montage of her psychological recovery. After the events of Halloween 78, Lori spends some time in an institution, where similar to her stay at Haddonfield Memorial Hospital, she spends most of her time slipping in and out of catatonia, which explains her repressed memories. The story then picks up with her 10 years later, where she's now been remolded into this young yuppie type, with her finger on the pulse of the MTV generation. As I mentioned before, this script is oozing with 80s pop culture and imagery, and none of that is more omnipresent than within the world of Lori's career. In the week leading up to Halloween, her latest assignment finds her preparing a high-profile cover story for an upcoming issue featuring a big-name rock star. At the time this script was written, both the Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street franchises were heavily influenced by MTV, with musicians like Alice Cooper and Dawkin making soundtrack contributions with accompanying music videos, so naturally, this Halloween script would compete with the other heavyweight franchises by attempting a similar gimmick. Therefore, the rock star being profiled by Lori would have been played by a real-life musician, possibly Sammy Hagar as envisioned by writer Mark Medina, where he probably would have had an MTV music video that featured Michael Myers. With Michael now in Chicago and hot on Lori's trail, he begins to weed out her inner circle, starting with the famous rock star. He does this by breaking into the rocker's mansion one night, where he murders both the musician and one of his groupies who's there taking a shower after they finish having sex. It's here where things would have gotten very meta. If you already saw my last video, where we covered the Dennis Etchison script, you'll remember how Michael went on a murder spree of Haddonfield's Lost River Drive-In while the moviegoers were watching Friday the 13th sequels, literally depicting Michael killing people alongside with Jason killing people on screen. This movie takes it even a step further as during the double murder of the rock star and his groupie, we're simultaneously shown Lori and her husband Terrence sitting at home watching Psycho. As they get to the infamous shower scene, the screenplay intercuts the characters watching the movie, with Michael murdering 
murdering the girl at the same time. And on top of things, Lori is technically watching her real life mother getting killed, as Jamie Lee Curtis is Janet Lee's daughter. Now, besides being his first kills of the movie, the scene at the Rockstar's mansion also serves another purpose in the story, as it's here where Michael gets a new makeover. Of course, by now, we all recognize Michael for his traditional wardrobe of the mechanics coveralls and white mask, and in all fairness, the franchise was still very young at this point, so there weren't a lot of rules in place for how Michael had to look. This was especially the case for the last script, where Michael's wardrobe was described as being a black shirt with a long black coat. This script, however, takes things a little too far, as Michael raids the rock star's closet and ends up wearing a black leather jacket with a pair of black leather pants. He also grabs a pair of black leather driving gloves to complete the ensemble, which comes in handy for the Porsche that he ends up stealing out of the garage. As far as the mask is concerned, it should be noted that there is no mention in the script of fire damage or anything, but let's be honest, that thing probably melted off of his face by the end of Halloween 2. In any event, we never see Michael get a new mask, it's just already there when he shows up in Chicago, so I guess it's just presumed that he got a new one somewhere at some point. Maybe he's like Batman and just has a bunch of them in his shape cave beneath the Myers house. Honestly, the screenwriters seem to adopt a mentality that anything worth questioning could be answered simply by saying that everything about Michael is a mystery, therefore leaving these kinds of questions better left unknown. In any event, Michael seems to be enjoying himself quite a bit, as he's now able to stalk Lori around town from behind the Porsche's tinted windows, very much like he did while driving around in the original. He also takes the car on a little joyride, where he ends up driving it into a crowd of people, standing outside of a movie theater, where we later find out he killed 13 in total. But wait, there's more, because in an attempt to make this screenplay even more meta, we would have been left with a shot of the giant marquee overhead, indicating that the movie they were all lined up for was to be none other than Halloween 4. That's right, the very same movie that we would be watching if this script were to ever hypothetically get made. Think about that one. They were literally going to see a movie in which they were murdered. I don't know if there was some sort of meta quota that Mustafa had wanted filled with these script submissions, but this would have surely surpassed all expectations and gone on to be the greatest paradox of the entire Halloween franchise. In another scene, Michael also slashes the throat of a police officer who is taking a nap in his cruiser. I don't want to nitpick too much here as I haven't read the script, I've only seen the plot summary, but this particular kill, I do take umbrage with. Part of what makes Michael such a unique and dangerous killer is that he lives for the chase, so to speak. What I mean by that is that Michael has been shown to be selective about who he kills. The best example of this might be the baby in Halloween 2018 that he walks by and probably momentarily thinks about killing, but ultimately doesn't. The reasoning behind that logic is that there's nothing to be gained by it for him. An infant doesn't yet understand the concept of mortality, so there's no consciousness of fear in such a a victim. The same thing can be said for somebody who's deep in sleep. Michael wouldn't just go up to somebody sleeping in bed and kill them without them being present in the moment. He would hide under their bed and wait until they wake up at some point in the middle of the night and kill them then. But I digress. Lori eventually begins to feel Michael's presence stalking her, although she doesn't yet realize who or why. This takes us back to her therapy with Dr. Loomis, where during one of her sessions with him, he attempts hypnotherapy to trigger her memories, which ends up working, leaving Lori in an even worse mental state than she was in before, as she now knows who Michael is and fears he'll return to kill again, a concern that Loomis not surprisingly shares with her. Now, this is where things get a little confusing to me. Loomis's concerns lead him to having Michael's body exhumed from the graveyard where he's buried in Haddonfield. The reason why this doesn't make any sense is because we already know from the prologue that Michael was lost in Lake Michigan, where he was presumed to have drowned, so it really doesn't make any sense why he would have a gravesite with a coffin, or why Loomis would think he was buried there. The only explanation that makes any sense is that there was some sort of cover-up for the negligence involving the worn-out safety cable, but even then, that is never explained anywhere in the script, not to mention the fact that Loomis would probably have wanted to see Michael's body to know for sure that he was dead before they put him in the ground. 
in any event, he's going to look at the body now and shocker, there isn't one in the coffin. <laughs> Rather than investigating this, he immediately assumes the worst, which to his credit turns out to be true, as the sun is now setting on Halloween night, and he's rushing back to the city in a stolen coroner's van to rescue Lori from the boogeyman once again. While this is all going down, Lori is back in the city getting film developed at a one-hour photo, because this script didn't already have enough reminders of what decade it was set in. It's here where she looks through the family photos she had taken earlier that week in her very own backyard, where she can clearly see Michael in his white mask, lurking behind some bushes, meaning that he's already been to her house at least once before. Of course, with this day being Halloween and the well-being of her six-year-old daughter Stephanie hanging in the balance, Lori races home to save the day as well. Back at the house, Michael is already stalking both Stephanie and her teenaged aunt Heather, where he murders the latter by jamming her hand down the garbage disposal, which ends up devouring her entire arm. Of course, this brings us to another parallel to H2O, in which the garbage disposal was used as a fakeout, so it's nice to see that it would have been fully actualized in this script. After killing Heather, Michael pursues little Stephanie all throughout the house during a very lengthy chase scene, only for Lori to arrive just in time to save her, where it's then revealed that her husband Terrence is also dead when she finds his body stabbed to the wall in a recreation of the Bob kill from the original. As this is going down, Loomis is speeding towards the house when he loses control and crashes into a utility pole just outside. This knocks out the power in the area, giving Michael an even greater advantage over Lori and her daughter, but it also causes some power cables to land in the swimming pool in Lori's backyard. Lori, now in pitch darkness, defends herself and Stephanie against Michael by lodging a fire poker into his skull, who unfazed by the blow continues to go after them. This takes them out to the driveway where Lori gets in her BMW and runs him down, only for him to get back up and continue his pursuit. Michael eventually corners them in the backyard where just as it seems there's nowhere left to run, Lori picks up a steel pronged rake and charges him with it, knocking him right back into the pool. No sooner does this happen that the power is restored to the area, sending thousands of volts of electricity into the pool and throughout Michael's body. Loomis, who survived the accident, shows up just in time to witness Michael getting out of the pool, but it's here where Michael's eyes begin to glow bright white before going completely dark, followed by smoke coming out of the mask's eye holes before he catches on fire and explodes into a big, fleshy mess of chunks. Lori, Stephanie, and Loomis embrace in a warm hug that's followed by a time cut to a shot of Michael's brand new tombstone, which is now engraved with the dates, 1957 to 1988. Obviously, the thing that stands out the most in the story are the similarities to H2O. Granted, this script was never made aware to the public until recently, so it's hard to say if H2O screenwriter Robert Zappia had access to it, or if it was just a lucky coincidence that there were so many similarities. One of the earlier drafts of H2O had even featured Michael meeting his end in a gymnasium swimming pool, and the character of Terrence does in a way feel like a precursor to Will Brennan, trying to be Laurie's emotional support system without knowing the full extent of her past. Of course, that's not any fault of her own since Lori can't intentionally be hiding a history she has no recollection of, but in and of itself, that poses another huge plot hole, which brings up a lot of questions. Sure, we can easily believe that Lori repressed all of her memories from Halloween 78, but can we realistically expect there to not be anyone or anything in her life that would remind her? Even if her parents didn't want to tell her, is there no way this information couldn't be found out through public record? Surely her employers would know. It's not like she's changed her identity like she did in H2O. She's still living as the same person. Also, is she not the slightest bit curious as to whatever happened to her friends Annie and Linda? What about that date with Ben Tramer? Are we to assume that she also repressed her entire pre-Halloween memory of all of those people too? There's just a lot about this script that could have been ironed out, especially the fact that its forward momentum is entirely predicated on the characters discovering revelations that we, the audience, already know about, meaning that we spend the entire movie several steps ahead of the plot. Compare that to Halloween 2, where even if you despise the plot twist of finding out Lori is Michael's sister, at least that was information we had learned at the same time Dr. Loomis had. Not everything is entirely bad though, Lori is shown to be a much more active protagonist here. Previously, Loomis had been the one to save the day, but in a reversal of roles, he's kind of the ineffectual one, whose actions only seem to cause more of a hindrance before unintentionally saving the day. This would also have been the most interaction Lori and Loomis 
ever had in the franchise, since they had only been mere strangers to one another ten years earlier. In any event, this script would never stand a chance, as the writers soon found out that Jamie Lee Curtis had no intention of returning to the role. I do find it very curious that this information was gleaned this late in the sequel making process though, as I would have assumed that was the reason she wasn't included in the previously written Etchison script. In lieu of this, Medina and Kenny attempted a hasty rewrite in order to salvage the story, which took out Lori altogether and gave her dialogue and scenes to other characters. Specifically Aunt Heather, who gets a bigger role and survives the movie, with Loomis also stepping up and being the one to ultimately save the day again. In the end, this story was too heavily predicated on Lori's involvement, and with the exception of a recast, there was no way this premise could feasibly work. On top of that, they full-on explode Michael into bits at the end, and as we know how protective of the slasher Mustafa Kat had become, he was probably looking for a more open-ended demise, which could have easily facilitated a future resurrection. I want to thank my Patreon supporter Matt Vowles. If you guys want to check out even more Halloween-related content, including the next Lost sequel as it becomes available, you can click right here on either of these links. Until then, I've been Zach Cherry, and I'll be right back.